Well, hello and welcome to The Apologetic Dog. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're new to The Apologetic Dog, this is an apologetics ministry. Um, the verse that I try to ground my uh, vision for what I'd like to accomplish is in 1 Timothy 6.20, where Paul is telling Timothy, hey, guard the deposit that's been entrusted to you. Guard this gospel of grace and do this by warring against pagan philosophy and exposing the false knowledge that contradicts itself. And so uh, we do this by standing on the word of God. Jesus said, your word is truth and that the word of God will sanctify um, the disciples. And so that's what we seek to do is just to stand on the Word of God and to destroy any knowledge that tries to rival um, the Word of God and its truth. And so I just want to encourage you to please like and subscribe the Apologetic Dog. That really helps us circulate our content to a broader audience. And so, like I said, thank you so much for joining. Today, um, I'm going to be introducing the topic uh, once again on eschatology. Um, I had a dear friend reach out to me and express his concerns about Gary Demar. Um, a lot of th- I, I actually really appreciate Gary Demar for so many things. Um, I grew up that premillennial dispensational mindset and was very comfortable in my eschatology and and trying to shoot down any opposing thought. And Gary Demar, I believe he wrote the book uh, Last Days Madness or something like that. And listening to some of his lectures really started making me think about what is this generation referring to in Jesus' Olivet Discourse? And so Gary DeMar is a scholar. He spent a lot of his work in the, the realm of eschatology. But my friend that reached out to me um, has many concerns that we're going to get into today about some of the dangers of what he is getting into and sounds almost identical as a full hyper preterist and so that is going to be the main focus today and my friend is none other than dr sam frost how are you doing today i'm fine uh had a good day the weather is uh we went from uh 20 below zero to now we're in the 30s (laughs) yeah well uh, Man, that's really cold. Um, have y'all got much snow here recently or anything like that? Uh, it's now starting to melt, but yeah, we've been in snow for the last week. Yeah, well, hey, I like those glasses. I don't think I've seen you in those on um, the past times that oh, you've these been. Are new glasses. These are new reader glasses. <laughs> Some more spec. I broke the other one. I was trying to get Dr. Frost earlier to consider wearing contact lenses, but he said he's not interested in any of that. No. <laughs> Oh. Well, Dr. Frost, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Now, you've been on the Apologetic Dog before, but where can people find you? Where is your heart and your passion at um, in some of the work that you've been doing lately? Um, well, most of my stuff is on the, you can flash that up or whatever, vigil.blog, mm. um, dot blog. So most of my just spurious writings, I usually take 30, 40 minutes to write something and then crank it out there. I don't proofread it or anything. I just write it and then shoot it out. Um, <laughs> it's dangerous when I don't proofread the reading. things that I write, Dr. Frost. Yeah, so my biography and all of that stuff is on there. So. Yeah, we'll definitely post that website uh, below. Uh, I encourage um, any of our viewers, go check out some of the books that Dr. Frost has written. What are, what are some of the, the main books that you've written that... Um, you're most proud of well the latest was is uh daniel unplugged which is a commentary i spent a year working through uh translating and working through the material of daniel which is a, a c on its own mm. um the material on daniel is so I, that book is is doing well it was reviewed by a few scholars they they enjoyed the challenging of it it's a different take on the on a few passages and then um the uh, cross and or not across uh the parousia of the son of man i'm think i'm going to revise that one you can still get it in its first edition but um been getting a, again a lot of feedback on that that i should seek out a publisher on that i published that through lulu uh, publishing, which is an indie publisher. Cool. Yeah, I hope a, to write a book one day. A couple, couple of publishing houses that are interested in that one. <laughs> like Daniel. Daniel was published by a publishing house. 
Yeah, um, well, I will post well, those books in the show notes below so people can go check that out. Now, I mentioned a key yeah. word earlier. Um, a lot of people that watch this probably are already familiar, but I want to touch on it briefly. I mentioned um, earlier Gary DeMar is starting to say things that sound like a full preterist, a hyper preterist. And what I mean by that is there is this view out there, um, a type of eschatology that says that Jesus Christ already returned, already came back at 70 A.D., that the the living and the dead, the resurrection has already occurred, and that we're living in this new heavens and new earth uh, right now, and it's going to continue on infinitum. Everything that you see is going to continue on into infinity. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I think pastorally, Dr. Frost, that burdens my heart. How do I counsel people? You know, how, how do I tell people, uh, how do I comfort them in the light of death rather when, when they've lost a loved one or they are approaching the last... Um, days of their life um, this is it you know you know I just I, I find that so troubling in so many ways and yeah. hyper, we say hyper preterism because we think it's totally out of balance they maybe have some key principles that we say yes yeah, 70 AD was important the destruction of the temple and many of the events that surround that but we think it's hyper it takes it to an extreme the things that uh, the church has always held on to that's so important in terms of eschatology Jesus is coming back to rule and reign bodily, to set up an eternal kingdom here on earth to restore all things and to judge the living and the dead with this um, future resurrection. Those are so important to hang on to when we start yeah. analyzing the orthodox views of eschatology, like premillennialism, all millennialism, and postmillennialism. And then hyper just kind of jumps off the cliff. And so. You reached out to me, um, and I remember on Facebook, uh, Dr. Frost, you're like, all right, I feel another episode coming on, <laughs> and yeah. I just said, hey, let's do it, but we, you said that to me in light of a post that you said about Gary DeMar, so if you would, tell us a little bit more about the um, concerns about Gary DeMar, maybe some things that he's done that's had a positive influence in scholarship, but I did notice you gave him a D minus, <laughs> and so... Uh, when it comes to eschatology, maybe um, you can tell us a little bit yeah. more what you were getting at with that. Um, well, I've been reading Gary since uh, he was publishing newsletters, uh, biblical worldview newsletters back in the early 90s. And I've been reading whatever he writes, um, I would get to read. And uh, he was with the um, early on with. I was in Bible college and then working at the Bible college in the bookstore and in the uh, distance education program that they had there in Pensacola. And I got to meet, I would meet with Jim Jordan, James Jordan. He lived in Niceville and I was in Pensacola. So I'd get to meet and talk with uh, James Jordan. But at the bookstore, uh, Gary was with this uh, Gary North. Um, who was uh, Dominion Press, and they were publishing out of Tyler, Texas. And uh, Ray Sutton, James B. Jordan, uh, David Chilton, and, and Gary DeMar, and, and, and Dr. Gentry, uh, Kenneth Gentry. And so I was getting all of this kind of material as uh, working in the bookstore. Just started reading Gary and liked what he was saying. It was A lot of it was typically reformed post-millennial stuff that you could read back of the old post-millennialist um, kind of things but you know a lot of it hooked me but his preterism uh, at the time um you know was already catching on uh, with me and being at bible college of course you're exposed mm -hmm. to all of these different views i was raised in the dispensationalist fourth square gospel church nice. so <laughs> at bible college you're exposed and then i had a couple of good mentors that exposed mm -hmm. me to uh, quite a bit so of uh, material of scholarly material and so, you know, I just always read Gary, uh, respected what he was doing, saw what he was doing. But Gary back then was typical preterist post-millennialist. He wasn't saying right. anything that was, you know, you couldn't Dr. find Frost. somewhere else in the history of, of Christianity. So there wasn't anything, you know, if you, I'm not post-millennial. Before we I get into to some of the big concerns uh, with Gary DeMar, uh, there's a few things that stood out to me that he wrote about and that he talked about in some of his lectures that yeah. I like that started to kind of crack yeah. the armor, if you will, of my premillennial dispensationalism. And I already alluded to one. Uh, one of those was, you know, how do we understand this generation 
in the Olivet Discourse, and he kind of grounded that with um, the pr- the previous chapter in Matthew 23, where Jesus is kind of giving the scathing rebuke to the Pharisees, referring to them as this generation. And I just thought contextually that's a strong case to make. And he interpreted uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, I think it's 13 and 14, about the Son of Man. He was just basically showing me how this um, is connected with um, the Great Commission and the Ascension. And I thought, man, that just, in terms of scope, I feel like that's very powerful and it's um, giving a strong explanation of what's going to happen. He's he's going, uh, you have to make sure I'm saying this right, but he's in that text he's going to the Ancient of Days, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. And he's not going from the Ancient of Days. Right. And I noticed my dispensational eschatology kind of had it backwards. And so I thought that was really compelling. And um, I enjoyed, actually, he, he debated, I think it was Michael Brown on the Gospel Truth. I want to encourage people to actually go watch that um, debate. Uh, there are things that I like about Michael Brown. Uh, but with anybody, I want people to exercise discernment and, and caution. Uh, but that was just a good exchange to get, you know, a premillennial perspective with a postmillennial, and we're going to get into how partial preterist Gary DeMar is, sounding at least. But that was that was just a good debate. Um, so I've I've been following him like you were saying, just from a distance um, as a learner, and yeah. I appreciated a lot of his work. And so we always want to give credit and honor where it's due. But you told me, uh, or really in this post on Facebook, you're just like. All of the hyper preterists are rejoicing at what oh, yeah. Gary DeMar is saying. So, what were some of the things that just sounds like a hyper preterist with what he's been saying? Um. Well, uh, the, the the first and foremost was uh, he was asked on one of his podcasts of what happens to you when you die, and he says we mm. get a new body in heaven. Um, just that right there. Mm. Um. Can you go more in depth on why that's so important? Well, it, 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 that implies that uh, if we get a new body in heaven, then there's no resurrection at the in the last day, mm. uh, as, as that is uh, by liberal. I read mostly liberal scholars. Um, that's that's understood as a resurrection in the last day, which is a typical kind of Judaism. Mm. And um, so, but if I die and get my body then, then there's no future resurrection. It's an individual, it's purely individual. Hmm. Um, so there is no general, that's, that's a denial of the general resurrection of the dead. And secondly, oh, wow. getting a body in heaven, a body that never died, is not a resurrected body. You're not, hmm. it's just one spirit migrating into another body. So it's a transmigration of a spirit into another wholly other body that is not even mine. It's, 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 I guess it's some meat sack that's waiting up there in heaven for me to slip on into when I die. And that, that it's, it's uh, all times, all kinds of problems. So when I heard that, yeah. uh, that to me was, um, Red that said Stevens and that, yeah, that's, well, that's bull preterist. That point about really, that's not a resurrected body. Um, just receiving a body in heaven yeah. one day in the, you know, uh, was that something that led you kind of out of the hyper preterist movement? I know we've we've done shows before, and you've talked about a myriad of things that, you know, even logically speaking, it's not a coherent worldview to hold. No. Um, but kind of that route that Gary Demar is going down was that a sticking point ever for you when you were in the hyper preterist movement? Yeah, we got around it. I mean, I first adopted that view. That's Ed Stevens's view, um, and a few a few others. Um, Michael Beeler, I think, is another full preterist. But it's a minority view among full preterists. The majority view among full preterists is Don Preston's view, which he got from Max King, which we call the corporate body view. Mm. The corporate body view actually stays faithful to the to the syntax of, for example, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. The body that is sown is the body that is raised. Mm. So, and uh, again, all... Uh, Greek scholars, liberal conservatives that are looking at the syntax, and I've been reading Greek for 30, you know, going on 30 years now. Um, it's very clear what Paul's saying there. Uh, and that's where we came up with the expression, the theologians came up with the expression self-same 
body. That's the word why they use that, because the body that goes in is the body that goes out, which is the definition of what resurrection. Your spirit's not being raised from the dead. Your soul's not being raised from the dead. Your body that is dead is being made alive again. Anastasis, it's standing again. Mm. That's what resurrection meant. And again, you could go through Charles Worth and Collins and Wright and all of these uh uh, Vesterman and, and all, they all say the same thing. They know what it is. They don't. Some, a lot of liberal scholars don't believe it, but they will tell you that's what that te- you know the text says. Right. And so, getting the idea of dying and getting a body in heaven just goes against everything. And this was even around with the Manichaean view, uh, view in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Calvin uh, takes a shotgun <laughs> at that view and goes off and, and states so. Uh, Preston's view is called the corporate body view, and that has nothing to do with getting new bodies or your body or physical body, or it doesn't have anything to do with any of that at all. And so uh, the view that I heard DeMar state, that we get new bodies in heaven, that's a minority um, view, and it's not been a very popular view. It's been floated around, like I said, in Calvin's day. Uh, Gnostics, the, the Gnostics held to some sort of Thing like that. Now, when I say Gnostic, there's Gnostics. There's there were several view. There were several views of Gnosticism. Sometimes they fought with each other. You got in trouble last time. You said yeah. hyperpreterism well, was a form of neo Gnosticism because it's like, again, it's <laughs> it's ditching this meat sack and slipping into a better meat sack. And how you call that re- re- resurrection? It's, can can, it, can it's Gary not, Moore at way. all somehow try to say the body that we're in now that dies and decomposes? Could that be the one that we receive in heaven? Well, how would that be? Because mm. I can go. I mean, there's bones, and we can dig up mummies, and yeah, you know, I, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I'm, yeah, the, my my sister and my dad are still in the casket, so that's that's where they are. So has he clarified if you receive a new body immediately when you go into heaven, or is there still some some type of time frame no. you're waiting? Or well, I've heard of a again, review called Soul preterist, Sleep. In the preterist scheme, um, you know, even the Soul Sleep guys, they're better at exegesis than this, because at least they affirm <laughs> the resurrection of the dead. I would actually go along with them more than I would this nonsense. Oh, so <laughs> basically you have, because of the fulfillment in 70 AD uh, Christians now here's here's the benefit we get unlike Abraham Daniel or Isaiah uh, when they died they went to uh, the spooky world of nether world the nether world you know they went to this uh, chamber of ghosts or whatever and now in 70 AD because Jesus knocked down the temple all of these spirits got released and got bodies in heaven so the benefit to us living in the age to come, mm-hmm. in the old preterist view, is that when we die, we don't have to go to uh, the spooky cave of, 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 of Hades. Mm. Uh, we go immediately to heaven and get our body, and then that's it. That's, that's the goal. It, it's not heaven on earth. It's not new heavens and new earth. It's, that's, the goal is die, go to heaven. That's pretty much the goal. Um, because right. life on this earth, and here's another thing Gary's, I heard him in his last podcast uh, flirting around with. He doesn't come out on a definite thing, and he has not yet. Gary has stated that he is not a full preterist. But he's done podcasts with Kim Burgess, who is a full preterist. He calls himself a consistent preterist. It's very easy to say, I'm not a full preterist. I'm a consistent preterist. You've got me mixed up with those full preterists. These are all word games to me. I've been doing... Yeah this for too long you've been down that road before i've been i know all the players i know all the arguments like the back of my hand you're not going to slip one by me uh i I eat (laughs) drink and breathe this stuff on a daily basis and i've been doing that since 1998 on a daily basis dr frost i was born in 92 i don't know how that makes you feel exactly (laughs) (laughs) and so it's um, just so I, I hear these trigger words, these little buzzwords, and I think, oh, that's full preterism. That's, you know, no yeah, so no the first big out. concern that we're talking about is he says there's no general resurrection 
which the church yeah. at large has said this is a this is a part of that blessed hope that we're looking forward to to receive it's, resurrected bodies fit for eternity and that does Bible not says. have and is not um, no longer cursed by sin right i mean this is one of the yeah. you know there's a lot of discussion about the nature and the book of revelation but I believe it's in Revelation, is it 21, maybe 20, or 21, that 20. just talks about there's a future hope where there's going to be no more crying, no more weeping. Yeah. Um, everything that's going to be accursed is going to be done away with. It's going to be restored. It's something that I would interpret Romans 8 to be talking about all of creation is groaning for this restoration for the yeah. sons of God, essentially, sons of glory. And so <clears throat> he's saying no no future general uh, resurrection. He's just saying when you're ushered into heaven, you have kind of this new body, and you're saying there's no way that that could be a resurrection, right? Going from here to there and well, then receiving. A by body. definition, it isn't. Yeah, because right, the so, resurrection yeah. is uh, somebody getting. Jesus defines it very clearly. When those who hear the voice of God will come out of their tombs, mm. each uh, some under perdition, some under eternal life. And Matthew yeah. uh, or John five twenty eight, he says, "When they, the, when all who are in their tombs shall hear the voice of the Son of God, some, so that's the just and the unjust. Mm. So, do the unjust get new bodies too? When you see, it, and this is the thing that they avoid. We've been around. I've been around. I've tried to every which way, but loose with with all of this stuff, and it just doesn't. It doesn't work when you've got everything crammed into seventy right. A.D. as your as your terminus, which they right. do. And so they, they kind of shoot themselves in their foot, as I did for over a decade. I shot myself in the foot trying to work out a, a Venton Shaung or a, or a worldview. Um, I tried to work all that out. Yeah. Because I had had my, my biblical theology and I had had my systematics theology. And again, I had wonderful mentors. So being a full preterist, I was trying to work all that out in a catalog of, of uh, what... The, I got to turn that off. You're a popular um, guy. Yeah. Oh no, this this doesn't stop. <laughs> um, so I had to work all that out in terms of building a Belton or a or a worldview, and in doing so, um, I wanted to go through all of the typical categories that would um, create a worldview. And that was here that I began to see that we were we were jettisoning everything that was that was definitional of what Christianity was historically. We're just getting away. We're just we're it's we're we're redefining Christianity itself. Yeah. Jesus is no longer a human being. Um, that's Don Preston and a great Bill Evans. He's no longer incarnate. This goes against the text, by the way. There's a reason why a statement of faith says. Do you believe in the visible bodily return of the Lord? Why do they put the word bodily there? Because he's continual, he's incarnate. Mm. Because the Greek text states that he who has come in the flesh is in the flesh. So yeah. in 1 John 4, it says those who denied that Jesus has come, perfect tense, and is. The King James Version is actually a good translation. It states who is come mm. in the flesh. And it's bringing out the present aspect of a perfect tense there. Uh, he who has right been now. raised from the dead, that's a perfect tense. If you have been raised and is still raised from the dead. So to deny that, um, forget your eschatology. That's just Christology. Mm. That, it's, you're, you're done at that point as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Frost, I'm going to have to remember that point. I'm teaching through First John on Wednesday nights here at 12.5 yeah. Church, so I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to key in to how there are certain aspects to our eschatology that directly relate to our Christology, who Christ is, and like you're saying, cool. the incarnation, the hypostatic union. And then this definitely touches on our blessed hope, and hyperpreterism says, oh, it's a realized hope. It's a, it's a realized yeah. eschatology, and so it's just, it's just directly backwards. And so yeah. with Gary, going back to Gary DeMar, very problematic, his view of denying a general resurrection. And something else that we've been talking about, um, and I was like, Dr. Frost, I really want you to spend some time unpacking this. 
But he's interpreting the phrase, the end of the age, to necessarily mean the last days of this old covenant. Is that right? Is that kind of the concern that you're referring That's to? Right. That pretty much is staple full preterist teaching, whether you're on the Ed Stevens side of things or you're on the Don Preston side of things. That's There they find a point of unity. And there are a handful of preterists that say that as well. Not a lot. Mm. Um, even Mr. Uh, uh, Kenneth Gentry doesn't do that. He understands end of the age. The way that the... Way that the the church has always read it from all four quarters of the earth. Um, we, you know, we didn't all conspire together and say, "Hey, let's let's define this term this way." Mm. <laughs> it's what the it's what the phrasing means. It, it we we are all reading the scriptures for nineteen hundred years, and that's what that's what the term that that's from again. Whether you're, what all nations, languages, and tongues and tribes have all come to the conclusion, yeah, that's what that means. And that wasn't 70 AD. Mm, mm. So they invent this, like a dispensationalist, mm. they invent this Jewish age. And the and it ended, the Jewish age ended May 9th, 70 AD. You know, and that's where it gets uh, wacky, as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Frost, that's interesting, because high, or full preterist, to not use the uh, the other name of hyper, one of their claims to fame is they are directly opposed to dispensational uh, premillennialism, um, kind of like yeah. at every point in turn. And last time yeah. we talked about how they make us they make a few same moves that the dispensationalists do, like in sure. the all of it discourse. Yeah. It's kind of an all or nothing approach. They just put it all in the past is where the dispensationalist kind of puts it all in the future. But then they also do this next move is they have this hard divide between um, Israel and the church, right? And so um, I, I follow a few full preterists just to kind of see how their thoughts are developing. And it seems like there's such a wide variety of full preterists. It's hard to find strong unity. I mean, they all line up that Jesus oh, yeah. already returned right. at 7 AD bodily. Or, well, even then, they, they are split on, was it a physical bodily return and what that means and entails right. or just a spiritual one. But but it was in the past regardless. And so <clears throat> I, I remember back when, and I, was, and I love John MacArthur. Like, I think he's a, a faithful expositor, um, Christian. Yeah, I man. still benefit from his ministry to this sure. very day, his New Testament commentaries. But he, he was the first one to bring up the term replacement theology and it's kind of a pejorative against covenant theology saying oh y'all are just replacing israel with the church to where you know covenant theologians say we don't see it like that we think the church is israel in in some way you know what i mean and so i just thought that was interesting um because it's a it's a battle for terminology at that point and how you do see you know elements of national Israel versus the new man that Ephesians 2 starts to bring out with no more dividing wall of hostility. And so it's super interesting. And in my opinion, I think there is some genuine overlap of a type of dispensationalism that Paul used that word twice in Ephesians 1 and then 1 in Ephesians 3 with obviously God relating to man covenantally. So I do think there is a way to understand some of those things. But I notice that for preterist have to make kind of the same move that you have to say every time you read the word Israel, essentially this has to be referring to an ethnic nation distinct categorically than the church, church age. Um, am, I, am I following that right? Well, I mean, for Paul, Israel, not all Israel is Israel, but mm -hmm. he's, he, is, he is referring to Katasarka according to, according to the flesh. And the, the reading the prophets, which were woefully in, you know, inept in Isaiah very clearly states that the nations will be engrafted and drawn in and become Israel. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what he means by Israel is God's covenant people. Israel will be engrafted in that nations will be engrafted into their. Theirs are the promises. Theirs are the covenants. God made the covenant with Abraham, a real human being who's still alive, as far as I'm concerned, although he's not raised from the dead. But his promise is still outstanding because according to Romans 413 God promised Abraham the world mm. and he says that Romans 14 wherever you set your foot that's yours 
Look up at the stars. All of this is yours. I'm giving all of this to you. But Abraham understood, I don't want Canaan as it now is. It's pagan. Mm. We're worshiping false gods and there's pagan and sinfulness and everything else. I want a better country. Can you make this a better country? And God, Abraham understood that God will make it a better country. He'll make it a sin-free, death-free. Mm. That's what Abraham wanted. That's what he longed for. Why, who, who wants a piece of real estate that's full of people sacrificing their children to Molech? You know, right. I, you can have it. That, that, that land is polluted. Mm -hmm. Leviticus says that. The land is polluted. Mm -hmm. So Israel is to come into this land that God has given to them. And not only the land, but wherever they set their foot is now theirs. Yeah. So if they follow this, uh, these, these uh, external laws that God has given to them, then the blessings of that, what does that look like? Well, it looks like pretty much material blessings. Grass is greener. The trees are better. The fruit is so much you don't know what to do with all of it. There's no war. The enemies are at peace and the whole nine yards is going on. It looks like Eden. Yeah. All you got to do, all you have to do to, is, is obey. And I'll, I'll, I'll restore creation underneath your feet. And you will have all your enemies in subjection and in dominion over them. All you got to do, though, Jeremiah, is is obey. <laughs> um, That's it. So, <laughs> and so tying this back to do that. Mar, he so going back <laughs> to what you said Abraham earlier, either. he didn't obey either. <clears throat> So Gary DeMar is saying the end of the age is the last days of this Jewish old covenant, right? And yeah, he's I saying, I'm not, I'm not a full preterist, but, and you said on one con uh, podcast, he's saying being a consistent preterist or something like that. And well, Kim, um, Kim Burgess, who he's talking to, is, and that's in, who Gary is in league with. So Gary's not a, look. When Jason Bradfield and I, back in 2008, 2009, were coming up with this uh, ongoing fulfillment. So we were marrying post-millennialism with full preterism. We were trying to take these two things and, and marry them together. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were trying to do. So we had an ongoing fulfillment. Uh, we had a, the idea that of... Um, we would use, I would use John Murray's uh, redemption accomplished and applied. Mm. And so 70 AD, everything is accomplished. I had that book in seminary. Um, and then, uh, so since everything is fulfilled in AD 70, now it's being applied and manifested and realized. And so what would that look like a million years from now? Well, it looked like the blessings of the covenant that God has made with his people to restore all things. Right. Uh, we're going to make earth a happy place. That's that's and then you die. But it's not really death because physical death doesn't have is not part of the curse. See, you got to get around that What's well, spiritual death. But most of the people on the globe in a million years or 10,000 years, however long, you know, whatever, um, will be Christian anyway, because our religion is going to be the only one that outlasts all of them. Like the Mormons, hmm. we would read in. The Mormons is an eschatology religion. It can't last another thousand years. It's built on a failed predictions. Jehovah's Witnesses are built on failed predictions. You can't can, uh, the Islam is the same thing. It's built on these these false. But if you throw all that out, and that's all fulfilled in seventy A.D., well, then we're going to be the only religion left standing. Mm, mm. That's how we were reasoning, and so. The promises of Isaiah 65, which we saw is very much still very much this worldly. Uh, we thought that's how we're, we're bringing about the betterment of mankind. We, the Christian church, through what Jesus Christ did and accomplished in 70 AD, we're bringing about the utopian vision of mankind through the, the church. And eventually, uh, so you can see where post-millennialism just jumps up and down on that stuff. Right. Very true. You know, I, I, I was like, yeah, this is great. And then the end of the tribulation, so we're going to get rid of tribulation, sin, death, and, and evil, spiritual death, You know, not physical death. But physical death didn't have anything to do with the curse anyway, right? See, we spirit, you got to redefine all of this stuff in order to get away with it. But that's what they're doing on their podcast. It's, it's, it's very familiar. Um, 
language and Jason and I were doing this a long time ago, but it doesn't work. So, so with that, I want to look at a passage out of the Olivet Discourse and tell me if you know what um, Gary DeMar would say on this. Do you care if I read it real fast? Uh, the whole chapter? No, just the op- <laughs> just the opening yeah. kind of questions because yeah, admit- Jesus ahead. brings up the the end of the age or it's brought up. And um, I want to get your thoughts on it, and I wanted to know if you knew what Gary DeMar would say about this. So this begins by saying, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to the point to him, um, the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all of these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So I can imagine they were just shocked, you know. Verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us. When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so that that was a question. And so um, maybe maybe we can pause there. Um, but he does yeah. bring up the the end is not yet. So how does yeah. Gary Demar interpret the end of the age here in light of the rest um, of the Olivet discourse? Basically, conflate all of that together. When will these things? So that's a uh, the Greek is anaphoric, so it would refer back to what he just said about one stone not left upon another. So when will when will these things, when will these buildings come tumbling down? When will these things? So it's very specific. And what will be the uh, simeon uh, of your uh, of your presence? I translate that presence not coming. Um, it's parousia, um, a parousia is there. And then uh, the end of the age. Mm, yeah. And so what the pre- full preterists do is conflate that all into one question. Um, that's So when these things will be, the fall of the temple buildings, is the parousia, is the end of the age. It's all the same thing. Now, most scholars do not do that. Right, so that's, that's what I was wanting to do here just a little bit. Is so Gary DeMar... Like the hyperpreterist, like the dispensationalist, is saying this is one oh, event yeah, right. all crammed together. So, are we saying yeah. that there's really what two questions being asked here, and Jesus well, kind of? What do you think? It's it is one it is one question. That's that's the this from the standpoint of the disciples. They just heard a catastrophic. Uh, pronouncement by Jesus. That's that's gonna. Requ- that, how are you gonna knock all this down? The city of, of Jerusalem. That's gonna require um, an act of God. Uh, is this Sodom and Gomorrah kind of? God's gonna blow the city up. Um, you know that that's like me walking into a the football stadium and saying not, this stadium will not be here. <laughs> You'd look at me and think, well, you and what bulldozer? Because that would require an implosion of explosions. You need a demolition crew of thousands of people to bring this structure down. You know, it's a massive thing. So they're hearing that. So naturally they're thinking, okay, um, if that's the case, that's the end of the age. So they're asking, it's Jesus that comes back and says, these things will be, you will see Jerusalem fall. You will see famine, earthquake, and plagues, but the end is not yet. The end of the age is not yet. Don't confuse the destruction of Jerusalem mm. with what God is going to do. Don't confuse that with the end of the age. Instead, when you see the abomination of desolation, or in Luke's version, when you see the legions, the army is starting to, you start hearing that rumor of the war. Uh, don't wait for my glory to appear because it's not going to. Instead, hightail it out of there. Flee, run like a scared kitten. Get out of the city. That's the exact opposite of what we find with the Maccabean period, who stayed in the city, bared swords, fought, and were given deliverance. They defeated the Seleucid army, and they were given independence and delivered. Uh, Happy Hanukkah. We're in that. Well, we just were in that season. So, Festival of Lights. Uh, Jesus grew up with Festival of Lights or Hanukkah. They knew this. It's in John ten twenty two. This was their history. They knew who Antiochus Epiphanes was. They knew mm-hmm. 
the Maccabeans, they knew all of that. The Maccabean zealot, it, those that stuff was in the air. The South will rise again. You know, everybody knows in the South who Robert E. Lee is, even though that was nearly 200 years ago, but that, or 100 and some years ago. Um, but we all know who Robert E. Lee is and Ulysses S. Grant. It's part of our history. It's who we are. Well, they knew who Antiochus was. They knew right. the Maccabeans. They knew all of that. Jesus is referring to Daniel, who I think is referring to that period of time, second century BC. Um, again, I'm kind of hanging out with the scholars on that one. Yes, but anyway, that's, the, that's yeah. another point. You know. But anyway, so, Jesus states to them, these things will take place, but the end, that's the controlling, uh, very one of the first things that comes out of his mouth, the end is not yet. Yeah, don't conflate, don't mistake the two for the same thing. Because they're not. Yeah. Now, I don't want to derail us with this, um, but I noticed in Ken Gentry's book, uh, How We Missed the Second Coming, tell me what you think about this. And it's and I think it's charitable if we don't all quite see this the same way, but we're getting to the same conclusion. We might take a few different pathways to get there, but I believe Gentry kind of does see two questions being asked. And Jesus it's is possible. kind of— and, and remind me, I think he refers to a transitional text in uh, verse 36 because he's just saying you're talking about um, this generation surrounding the events at the, the destruction of the temple. But that day, right, uh, in verse 36, he's saying it's talking about something else. So it's like I think how he set it up was there's two questions being asked, and so Jesus is answering two different questions. One is you know, imminent, and something is uh, future. And I like what you're saying because— you're kind of bringing some clarity. He's like, don't get these things confused. Yeah. I, um, he, he defines the term in, in 24, uh, eight, when he says, uh, there, all these things are beginnings <clears throat> are beginnings of woe, beginnings of woes. Um, so pata de tanta arche podidon. So all these things. Now, when you say all these things, again, these, that's a very definite, all, that's, that's a closed set. All these things, not all those things, but all these things. Well, yeah. what, are the, what are all these things? Well, death, famine, persecution, hatred, wars, nation upon nation, kingdom upon kingdom, persecution, uh, earthquakes, a tribulation. They'll throw you into tribulation, it says. Some of you will be thrown into tribulation in verse 9. Then you will be handed over into tribulation. Thlepsis. There, there's the word there. So, okay, famine, earthquake, uh, plague, war. So what was Jerusalem, what was 66 to 70 AD? What was, well, it was a war. But the end is not yet. See, yeah, that, let me, that, let me go only, to that. These are only beginning contractions. And it's a play on terms because you have arche, which is beginning, and you have telos, which is end. So there's a clear play on, on terms. So as long as the arche of woes is going on, or contractions and these kinds of things are going on, which, what are those? Well, we're, we were just told famines, earthquakes, persecutions, hatreds. As long as that's going on, the end is not yet because the end brings these things to an end. Yeah. That's the Jewish expectation is that famines, wars, earthquakes, plagues, hatred, all of that stuff will end. That's what he said in Matthew 13. So all these things will continue. So did the disciples this generation, did they see all these things? And the answer is absolutely. Was it the end? No. Because he right. tells him it's, it's well, not. See, How do I know this? That because makes all these things still continue. They still happen. So this is where Gentry, I'm pretty sure I'm representing him properly. I don't know if you can see my screen, but verse 34, Jesus is saying, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So there, this is kind of pointing to 70 AD, a lot of these wars, tribulations, everything. Sure. And then 36, but concerning that day, you have to help me on the Greek there because um, Gentry makes a big deal of but concerning is a big transitional text that Matthew has used all throughout his gospel, especially back in 22 dealing with the Sadducees. Perry Day, did I get it? Do you know if uh, what, yeah. what the transitional phrase is? Yeah. 
Yeah, what did he do? <laughs> hey, I got that memory going on. It's been a while yeah, since I looked at his book. But he's very, very that common. Day, very common. Some, something future. He's saying no one knows the hour, right? There is something mysterious about the eschaton. And you've, you've yeah. mentioned Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they're they built around kind of nailing these things down. And no one claims yeah. more to have these things nailed down than the, the hyper preterist. The very very way you can find out if you're a cold or not is that they got the day, the end of the world pegged on a calendar. <laughs> With That's all the cold. charts. and Jesus explicitly says, do not go after people that are saying, the end is near, the end is near. Don't go after them. He says that in Luke. He's very clear. Don't go after these kooks. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, preterism is telling us that that's that the apostles were the kooks. Yeah. The end is near. The end is near. They weren't. They weren't doing that. Not like. And, and I think it's anachronistic. I think it's historically anachronistic mm. to read back into the first century the image of a guy standing on a street corner with a sign that says the end is near. That is mm. not that that's not what they were doing. That's not right. what the apostles were doing. But yet they were saying the end of all things has come upon us. What's going on here? What are they doing? Well, maybe because of dispensationalism that has influenced preterism, we're just understanding that we're not we're not coming at it. I'm not saying that general um, I, I'm saying the preterist here is not coming at it correctly. The scholars, they got it figured out. That's why I read more of them, uh, mostly liberal. <laughs> but, you know, the, these are the guys that write your Greek translations and stuff. So these are the guys that, that I, I, I trust them more than someone with some sort of dogmatic, you know, narrow-minded view that they've got to push on the text. Yeah, um, That's why full preterism, hyper-preterism will never go mainstream because most most scholars just are not going to i've talked to many of them um across the seas and here in america uh just through correspondence and stuff and they just laugh at it they said there's no way dr frost there's, it seems that, like hyper preterism has a way of dying out on its own and sure there's spikes but over time there pe people become um, have these existential crises because what's the point i mean it kind of falls into like even an atheistic mindset um, with the world continuing as is. And so, you know, I do think we, we need to give good, robust, uh, robust answers to questions like, well, what is the end of the age even talking about? And earlier you and I were talking about how this is pretty unique. It's at least first mentioned in Matthew's gospel, right? Uh, Jesus he's the only one that uses it. He's, he's the one that mainly uses it with the parable of the wheat and the tares. And so, yep. and to, to some uh, credit of people that say, well, doesn't the end of the age have to be tethered with, you know, this great white throne judgment or, or something? And we're saying, yes, that's why it's so important that you don't shoehorn everything back into the past. But the end of the age is mentioned there. We just looked at that passage in the Olivet Discourse. And this is one that really hits close to home with me with the Great Commission. Um, I wanted to read this briefly um, and tell you just a little bit of how I've oh, been having yeah. to deal with um, certain preachers in my local area that are becoming full preterist, more unashamed, unashamedly a full preterist, and claiming to be Southern Baptist. And I just pray that that stops um, at some point in the near future uh, because it just breaks my heart because that goes against um, historically what Southern Baptists have I'll just say that you. there's no such thing as a Southern Baptist full preterist. That's an impossibility. Yeah, it's a married bachelor, right, Dr. Frost? Right. <laughs> um, but this is right. this is one of the texts yeah. that they go to after an already established definition, dogmatic definition of what the end of the age is. Like Gary DeMar said, it's the last days of the Old Covenant Jewish, you know, end of the age. And so, you know, Jesus is saying here in the Olivet Discourse, or in the Great Commission, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the moment when all authority in heaven on earth has been given to him. And then he says, Teaching yep. them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so that's that phrase coming out, the last thing. And I can just tell you personally, Dr. Frost, that 
in my growth and walk with Christ, I have found so much comfort in this verse, knowing that Jesus is always with me. And I do think that is, you know, in virtue of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the ontological trinity and things like that that he mentions earlier or it mentions in John's gospel. But there's, there's a piece that we see in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, that God says that I am with you. Uh, he's with his people. He told Gideon that he'll be with them when he goes into war. So this is just something that I've always like. Man, this is kind of part of that blessed hope. He's with me now also until he restores all things. And then you got these hyper predators saying, well, this is in reference to 70 AD and Dr. Frost, this, this individual that's SBC, o- oxymoron, SBC, o- um, full preterist, is saying that the Great Commission is fulfilled, right? There were the elite, what he said is this text, he would not go to this text to say this is why we should evangelize. Now, I realize a lot of hyper-preterists just go ahead and you know teach universalism, which we talked about um, one of the last Max times about that's more consistent. But I'll tell sure. you this, Dr. Foss, tell me if this sounds strange. He'll go to Revelation. I don't remember if it's 14 or Revelation 22, where it talks about some type of, of healing of the nations outside of the kingdom. And that is more of his justification for um, evangelizing. He's not going to the Great Commission here because in his mind, oh, that's already done and, and fulfilled. And and Revelation or Romans chapter 1 talks about, you have to help me on the verse reference, but, oh, the Great Commission is already done. Um, the gospel has went out to the whole world or something like that. No, yeah, I, it did. <laughs> Yeah, and and this is what my response is. Yeah, it went to the Gentile world, and it started out in Judea, Samaria, but it's still going out to the uttermost parts of the world. And so yeah, that's, that's I get offended. <laughs> I take it personal when um, this wonderful great commission that the church should hold near and dear to evangelize the world is somehow already fulfilled at 70 AD, and I just... I don't know, Dr. Frost. Maybe I just I just get frustrated with that. No, you're right. And please don't think any more about it because you're <laughs> you're gonna end up your brain will explode because you are you you're trying to wrap your mind as how do they do that. So they so I guess the pre seventy AD missionaries, evangelists, and there were numerous, it wasn't just the twelve apostles, you know, people were spreading mm-hmm. the gospel everywhere. But when they came to the uh, Roman line where say an upper Gaul um, which is now modern day France. But since that wasn't Roman occupied territory, they had to stop there because Jesus only sent them to the known world at that time. You know, this is getting ridiculous. I'm being sarcastic. Right. <laughs> so they understood what uttermost parts of the world, they knew that the world was far more bigger than the Roman world. We, they, they knew this, we have this in the Greek. They knew of the Chinese, they knew of the Parthenians, they knew of the lower, way lower than Egypt. And Ethiopia, Kush, and beyond Libya, there were people there along the coastlands. They all knew that. They knew that people were there. They were trading with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rome knew that they were there. It's wherever you, it's the uttermost parts of the earth. The expression meant wherever you find earth, and you still have earth, and you're still walking in that direction, and it's still earth, that's that's the uttermost parts of the earth. Keep mm-hmm. going until you right. until you run out of earth. <laughs> and that, yeah. That's kind of an amazing myth. It's, Keep going until you run out of dirt, yeah. And you start hitting the you know oceans. And so if that, I time in, if I time in real crazy. quick, they are, these are human beings. You know, they're human beings. They understood this. If you read Strabo, uh, yeah. written first uh, late first century or early uh, early first century, uh, St- uh, Strabo's geography, he's talking about the Chinese and he's talking about the Indians and uh, the whole eastern. They they know these guys. They know these people. They were trading with them. Yeah. Um, to chime in real quick, uh, I preached a sermon, you know, on deep discipleship, and you know, we see Jesus giving the command to make disciples, and then he says of all nations. And please correct me um, if I'm wrong here, but you know, nations could be, has a lot of times been translated Gentiles. So this is a commissioning to go could. into the uttermost parts of the Gentile world, preaching this yeah. gospel of grace, right? And so in a kind of a succinct way, and I do want to get into some other passages, but how are we to understand this phrase to the end of the age? If it's not talking about 
the old covenant Israel last days, you know, summed up in 70 AD, then how are we supposed to understand this? Well, he states here, um, the phrasing is is stated here in such a way, the, the word always is not there. It's, it's, it's basically ami uh, pasas ta himeros, all the days. I am with you all the days. That's, mm. the, that's the, the Greek. And then um, until or even until the end of the age. So what that's telling me is Jesus is with them before the end of the age. Jesus will be with them to the end of the age, all the days before the end of the age and to the end of the age, Jesus will be with them. That's so that's that's uncontestable. Mm. So if he's with them before the end of the age, how? How is he with them? He Jesus has been ascended into heaven. Mm. So how is he with what do you mean you're with me? all the days until the end of the age. How would they answer so, that? Would they try to appeal to the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the, that would be the correct answer by the Spirit because Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, Colossians 3.1, where he is at the right hand of the Father. This was their message. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Well, how is he absent from body, present with the Lord? As long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Right. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus said he's with us always until the end of the age. Paul, what do you mean we're away from the Lord? But if you understand that the Lord is incarnate Jesus of Nazareth in heaven, right. who has been glorified and raised at the right hand of God, then you who have not seen Jesus, yet you still love him. First Peter chapter one, verse 10. How is it that I've, and I've never seen Jesus. I don't know about you. I've never eaten fish with him. I've never shook his hand or looked at his beard. I don't know. I've never met Jesus in my life. From one angle, in the enlightenment of the knowledge of the Son of God given to me as a deposit and guarantee by the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced that Jesus is at the right hand of God, that God raised him from the dead and seated him in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. I've never seen anyone seated at the right hand in heaven at right. the right. I get that knowledge from Scripture. But I still don't believe the knowledge when I even read the scriptures. Something else has to happen to me to convince me, convict me. This is the truth. What you're reading right here, that's the truth of the reality of the world. And I'm convinced of it. But having said that, I guess in a way from the Holy Spirit, I've Jesus has come to dwell with me and I with him. But yet in a very strong sense, I've never seen Jesus in my life. Right. Not not the way the disciples saw him, not certainly the way that Paul saw him 18 months after Jesus ascended. 18 months later, Paul's having a hearing a conversation. Jesus, of, He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you thought was dead. I don't know. I'm alive. I'm in heaven. I'm the one that uh, Psalm 110 talked about. And Paul, I'm going to convince you of that. And when I do, your brain is going to explode. Because you've been reading the Hebrew Tanakh all wrong. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, and it, it, see, that phrasing, all the days until the end of the age, the closest phrasing we can find of that is at the end of Daniel, hmm. chapter 12, verse oh, 13. Let me pull it's up. the same wording. It, it's an interesting wording because it's the only, uh, Matthew is the only one that uses the phrase end of the age. Uh, Paul picks it up, and then in Hebrews it's picked up. But so, Matthew's the only one in the Gospels that uses. We can't even find the phrase end of the age in any of the extra biblical material. That's not, it's not found. It's a very unique phrase. But most scholars think that probably Daniel 12, 13 is where that's coming from because there Daniel's told that he's going to die. You know, he's going to be at his end. He's going to die. And uh, then he'll rest. And then it says that you will rise or be raised and receive your inheritance. So resurrection, and then it uses the phrase suntalian himeron, at the end of the days, or end of the age. This is the phrasing, except Matthew uses end of the age, ion, and here Daniel's using end of the days. So what happens at the end of the days? Well, 
Daniel will be raised from the dead. Well, what's resurrection of the dead? Well, go to Daniel 12, 2, and it'll tell you what resurrection of the dead. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting perdition, the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Well, when is that going to happen? At the end, singular, of the days, plural. Or another way of putting it in Greek, this is the wonderful thing about Greek, is you can say the same thing multiple ways. Another way of putting it in Greek is last day, end of the days, or last day, same thing. So when is the last day? Is that phrase found anywhere? Well, it's found in John 6. Yep. And in John 6, uh, it's unquestionable what Jesus is saying there. All who are given to me, I will raise up in the last day. Whosoever cometh to me, whosoever believeth in me, all that are drawn to me, all that are given to me of the Father, I will raise them up in the last day. When is the last day? Well, that's Daniel chapter 12, 13. This is Jewish. This is Jewish thought. This, they, this is how they, it's the last day. It's not the last day of the end of your life. It's not the last day of the old covenant. What Jew would walk around talking, well, it's the last days of the old covenant. <laughs> That's the very thing that they were wanting to, they saw as going on. They, you, if you talked about the old covenant ending, they'd stone you. <laughs> so it's John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the Father who yeah. sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so In the last day. Yeah. In the last day. And then he so, quotes Isaiah yeah. right there, 45. Mm. As it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father. Now that's the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. That's New Covenant stuff, right? Mm. Now, so those of the New Covenant who are learning of the Holy Spirit, taught by the Holy Spirit, those are the ones who will be raised up in the last day. So I asked Michael Miano, do you have the Holy Spirit? And he said, yeah. And you're taught by God, right? You're in the new covenant, new age to come and all of a sudden. He goes, yeah. So when are you going to be raised? Because that promise is made to the new covenant people. Mm -hmm. And he just looked at me like a deer and caught in the headlights. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and yeah. then he said, well, that doesn't apply to me. I said, so the promise of being, the, the whole point of being taught by the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit is guarantee the deposit of resurrection. That's Ephesians. That's Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 1. This yep. is standard. Jeremiah, you know this stuff because it's standard 101 Bible theology, whether you're Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, Protestant, white, liberal, black. It, we've, for 1900 years, we've been saying this. And along comes these preterists that just are saying, ah, it's all wrong. Nobody knows what they're talking about. And my arrogance, I was arrogant. My, I look back on those years and I thought, my, my goodness, God, you had mercy on me mm. and, and my arrogance um, of trying to think that I'm going to tell everybody that they're all wrong for 1900 mm. years. They're all wrong. Big Sam, big, massive ego, big fat head Sam, <laughs> is, <laughs> you know, God humbled me. He, he, uh, he humbled me. In a well, mighty, mighty way. There's so many things that full predators. I still have a flat to. head, by the way. <clears throat> no, nah, you're, you're looking good, especially with those new yeah. specs. But I was, I was yeah. wanting to get your thoughts on this. We've talked about this on the phone and even a little bit in past episodes. But like I said, this is starting to pop up um, around Jonesboro, Arkansas, and <clears throat> you know we start talking well, about other things like spiritual you. warfare. Um, where is Satan in all of this? And of course. Huh. You know, all that ha Satan has to already be in the Gehenna, right? Because the great white throne judgment yeah. already happened when you start reading Revelation. Well, yeah, all that's done, right? And so uh, one of the, the preachers broke my heart because I, I remember reaching out to him uh, many months ago, really trying to caution him away from doing this, um, along with him calling me saying, oh, no, I think I'm a heretic. And I'm like, that's a way to start a conversation. Um, but where, where he's at now, and I just want to encourage people to think about this is where full preterism leads. Satan is no longer war, uh, roaming like a roaring lion, trying to devour whomever he can. He's no longer actively blinding unbelievers in their unbelief the way that Paul articulates. No, all that was before 70 AD. 
So what is the point of yeah. Ephesians 6 yeah. with the whole body armor of God? Because that was in a context That's funny telling you just us said that. that because I, just, I just clicked. Before you said that, I was searching, and I just clicked on that verse. You and I are on the same range. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm learning a whole lot from you, Dr. Frost. And this is why I want to tell you what he said and my initial problem with it. I mean, for one, what bigger deception, what bigger lie could Satan give to let you think that he's no longer here? Well, man, that, that to me already is like, oh, man, I'm going to be on high alert. You know what I mean? Um, not thinking, oh, yeah, he's no longer here. Because this, this was the conclusion that this individual said. Well, you know, we put the body armor of God on, not to war against Satan because that's all done away with but it's to war against the flesh and it's an immediate now we leap to you know james chapter one that says you know you got this progression that temptation gives birth to sin and sin gives birth um, to death and my the whole thing is wait a second that is not what paul is talking about in ephesians 6 no. he is saying our battle is not against flesh and right blood. now now right. do we war against our sinful tendencies romans 7 paul shows us that people that think you can reach sinless perfection well you surpass paul you know what i mean um but that's what they have to do is because we understand this world is fallen and it's interesting because i know the the hyper preterist mantra is don't appeal to your personal experience and give us clear exege uh, exegesis right but even this gentleman can't get away from the fact that oh man we we war against sin daily so there is a battle there is a war right we can feel it and I'm like, well, you already broke your standard on, you know, appealing to experience there. But that's my big concern, Dr. Frost, is where hyperpreterism leads to in so many ways, spiritual warfare. Satan and his minions are no longer warring against the saints, right? And to me, that totally undoes the point of what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6. Do you want to speak more to that? Well, no, you, you, you uh, have done a you're you're spot on the point because you know we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers against the authorities against powers of the present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places now classic post-millennialists they know what to do with that verse mm. um we're waging a cultural war but we understand that it's not about picket signs and uh, it, it, uh these are uh, abortion uh, proponents there's a spirit spirits there's a malevolent there's malevolent principalities and forces controlling judges and mm. government officials there's powers and we have authority and a power to fight against those so that we can love our enemies while at the same time praying for the defeat of these principalities and powers which will be one day subjugated and destroyed and placed underneath our feet. So the victory is ours. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a post-millennial battle cry right there because mm. the victory is ours. And so we know who we're fighting against. And the weapon that we have is love. Mm. Love our enemies. Serve your enemies. Try to talk and dialogue. Uh, don't point fingers at, you're going to hell. That's not. That doesn't work with flesh, in case you haven't noticed. But what does work on flesh? Love. Mm. Oh, love works. Hard to defeat love. Mm. It's it's hard to make an enemy out of somebody of, of a church that, you know, well, you know, if one person's saying, oh, the church, they're just, and then another, and I've heard these conversations. Another uh, pro-choice person would say, yeah, listen, really don't speak about that church right there because they really helped my family out in a time of need, man. And I mean, these guys really came to see, you can't argue against that. A picket sign, uh, you know, take your picket sign and go somewhere else. I don't have, I, what, where does Paul tell me to pick a picket sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to protest Roman Caesar injustice. Caesar Nero, you're the oppressor. You need to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. I mean, Paul, yeah, Paul is just not, that's why he says, I submit to the authorities that are in power. God set them up anyway. You know, this, this world is going to be ours, brothers and sisters. The world's going to be ours. We're going to inherit it. 
the meek will inherit all of this. So mm-hmm. love one another. Love your enemies. Bless those that persecute you. That's the counterculture opposite way of how you protest. You wash feet yeah. of, a, of a whore, a, a slut, which is what Jesus was doing. And he offended the, the leaders, but he was, this is the kingdom. This is how you do it. Lay down your life, pick up your cross, die to yourself, die to flesh. That's how you do it. Lay it that's how you do it. And I've found in the last few years of my life, doors have opened that mm-hmm. I never, ever, ever thought would be open to me because I'm, I'm serving. I'm learning how to serve. Um, I could tear up to thinking about, <laughs> you know, the, Hey, that's fine. Jesus wept. The, the goodness of God and my arrogant, those, these years of arrogance that I had, and then God just, you know, humbling and crushing that mm. and saying, you need to learn how to love my son mm. and you need to stop putting yourself first all the time. And that has opened up doors of, of service. Um, you don't get paid for it, mm. but I don't, my reward, see my, oh, here's another one. See, my reward is in heaven. It's, I don't, God takes, Hey, I got, Hey, I got clothes. I got a roof over my head. I'm good. Um, he provides for all of that. So what you're getting to, I think you're such, you have such a pastor's, you really do have such a pastor's gifting. I got a pastor's heart. That's where, I think that's where you're kind of seeing all of this. Um, I'm hanging out more in the academia thing, but you're hanging out more in the heart pastoral. Hey, I'm seeing how this is affecting people's lives. Um, and, and your concern is spot on it's like, because things that are destroying our families. Now, these are principalities and powers. Uh, I need to be in prayer. I need to be in service. I need to be operating gifts. I need to be, I need to be walking with the Lord who is with me always until the final defeat at the end of the age, which gives me the guarantee that my labor, you can, can you hear Paul straining here against all odds? And then at the end in first Corinthians 15, he says, your labor is not in vain. Mm. Amen. It looks like it might be because no one's paying any attention and no one's coming to your church and you're not, there's no big revival going on and thousands are just coming. And you know, it's that it looks like just each thing that you're doing is not being seen for what it is and all this bunch of other stuff. But if it's in the Lord, your labor, your labor is not in vain because the victory is yours. It's promised. You have a vision. You have a hope. You have a guaranteed future. It's, it is your, I think about this all the time. And so that, what that does is, is that allows me to serve. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is taken care of. All I have to do is, is, is serve because victory is ours. It belongs to us. I'm going to inherit the earth. I'm going to inherit the cosmos, treasures in heaven, forever, new heavens and new earth. Why am I worried about climate control or climate change? I don't care. What? <laughs> it, I don't worry about this stuff, but I do serve those who do worry about this stuff, who are distraught. I mean, I'm talking to people that they think the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't start recycling two liter plastic bottles. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, Dr. Frost, let me kind of recap. I got off on the rant there. No, that's okay. I love it. Um, let me tell me what you think about this because, you know, we originally started talking about Gary DeMar. We have a lot of concerns. Um, praise God that he does not identify as a full preterist. But the right. big concern is that he affirms so many things that causes the full preterist to rejoice. Number one, that um, you know, we just got done talking about the end of the age. He says is this end of the old covenant Jewish age. Those were the last yeah. days, kind of mentioned there, and <clears throat> you know, this really causes problems not only contextually with the the all of it discourse, but I think it it overflows into practically you know how how Jesus meaningful meaningfully said that he would be with us even to the end of the age. Uh, you know, yeah. other than just assuming um, things, I mean, that's why the the individual that I've talked with, he says, yeah, that's that's already done and fulfilled. That's not our 
great commission. He just goes to the book of Revelation, an obscure text in my opinion, to try to make the case yeah. that yeah. You, you got the new heaven and, and new age, but then you see this healing of the nations kind of flowing outside those walls. And he says, evangelism. And I just thought, wow, it blows my mind how we no longer, you know, in that paradigm can appeal to the great commission to evangelize the, the, the nations, right? right? The Gentile world. And remind me, uh, the first thing we talked about with Gary DeMar, oh, he denies the general resurrection, right? And so yeah. you made the point that um, for him just to say that we receive a body in heaven, that's not a yeah. resurrection, right? No. So those were two big points that we've kind of talked about. Is there anything else that um, you would want our audience to kind of be aware of? Now, we, we love uh, Gary DeMar. Like I said earlier, oh, there's absolutely. a lot of things that I respect him for, right? I recommend his books. Um, take it with a grain of salt, but you know, I, I don't, I don't agree. No one agrees with every word that I say. I don't agree with every word. I mean, I don't, you don't have to. I don't agree with every word that Calvin says. I don't. I, I, I believe. In I don't agree with anything that Gordon, Gordon Clark said. Right. I, I don't <laughs> agree with everything Gordon Clark says. Hey, There's right. some things he says that are that are quite lamentable. Um, <laughs> that I've read, and I'm like, oh, that's not good. Um. So, you know, I'm all for academic and exegetical freedom. I don't think we've uncovered every nugget of exegesis in every right. verse of every text. I think it's quite possible that for 1900 years we've read particular verses incorrectly. Sure, uh, theoretically, that has been that is possible. Um, in terms of demonstrating it in history. Uh, Read church, go through church history. There's where there have been epical changes in church history because we've been reading a verse here wrong, and it's 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 by grace alone. You know that's well that that simple reading of Romans four by a young Martin Luther that impacted the world. Oh, <laughs> big time! And um, Romans <laughs> one seventeen, right? The like just shall live by faith. Was, yeah, he wasn't the only one reading it like that. There were others as we research and see oh, throughout yeah. history, there were, there were others doing that. So Luther didn't invent that. Um, but he, you know, he was, it, people were saying, you know, we've been reading the Bible here wrong. That's, that's fine. I have no issues with that. That's not my argument against full preterism is that you're accusing the church of reading the whole Bible wrong. In a court of law, though, speaking practically, if I've got five witnesses that said that uh, I saw John shoot Susan. And you got one witness that says, oh no, John was with me. He couldn't have shot Susan. What do you think a court of law is going to decide? Mm. Now, they're going to appeal to the majority. Mm. It doesn't prove that John shot Susan. The one witness could be correct. But generally not. Right. So the burden of proof or onus probandi in Latin, so the, the burden of proof is always towards the weakest. You it's they you have to show the case. Mm -hmm. Those of in the majority of witness are, is in the uh, they don't have to prove or show the work. They already have. That's why they're sitting in the cat's bird seat, as we like to say in Indiana. Um, so you did you did bring up um matthew 13 which yeah, is the first time there. we see the phrase in matthew and that's a critical passage let's pull that up we got another good yeah, 10 reading, 15 man. minutes i don't want to take all your time you've been no, awesome been to to message me and say hey let's talk about some of these concerning issues with gary demar yeah um, usually in most cases i'm invited to to be on podcast but this time i know that I like doing yours, and I reached out to you and said, hey, would you, let's do this. Well, thank and you. I appreciate that you responded. Absolutely. I got your back, Dr. Frost. You do? <laughs> so, so we are in you the can go, parable you can go of the beads, is that right? Yeah, 36 is where he begins to explain it. Um, okay, yeah, that's right. So we don't have to read the actual parables. 36. Yeah. Uh, very simple stuff here. The one who sows the seed is the son of man. The, 
Here, here you go. This is a no-brainer. The field is the world. Now, preterists will say, they're, well, that's the Jewish world. Ah. Oh. Yeah. I don't see the word Jewish there, but anyway. The field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the, should we say, Jewish kingdom? <laughs> anyway, you see how... Right, so the good right. seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds, again, this is a pretty simple... Are the sons of the evil one who's no longer around? Does he still have sons anymore? Anyway, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Now, if that's 70 AD, this is what happened in 70 AD. The reapers are the angels. And just as the weeds, the sons of the devil, are gathered and burned with fire, that's Gehenna Lake of Fire, mm -hmm. so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom. Well, wait a minute. What's the kingdom? The field is the world. Mm -hmm. The kingdom, the, the world is God's kingdom. He, he rules the world. He will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. The preterist says Jewish lawbreakers, old covenant lawbreakers, 70 AD here. All causes of sin because the law is the cause of sin. Without where there is no law, there is no sin. And so old covenant law has been done away with and condemnation has now been done away with because the old covenant age and those lawbreakers in that old covenant age have been plucked out of the kingdom in 70 AD. And they've been thrown into the lake of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then it says the righteous will shine. That's a Danielic reference right mm -hmm. there. That's Daniel 12, 4. Then the righteous will shine. Um, yeah, like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So I guess after 70 AD we shined like the sun. Now that's creation language there, right? Mm-hmm. That's the, that's uh, that's 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 uh, that's like that's the language of creation it will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So it says here the the, the evil or wickedness. Though this is very much in close to what we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in much of, of Judaism. This this kind of stuff right here when God is going to show up and make all things right. I want to I want to read. Let me grab a book real fast. All Come right. On. I want to read something. While he goes away, I um, just want to take this time to invite our viewers. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the Apologetic Dog, please do that. Um, um, I back. just recently reached Dr. Frost uh, 600 subscribers. So, woo! <coughs> um, I've been very blessed. Uh, I started the Apologetic Dog Ministry, Dr. Frost, back in April. And so... Um, I'm I'm new to all this stuff. That's why a lot of times when I say, "Hey, let's start at six o'clock my time," it's usually about a good <laughs> goodness twenty thirty minutes afterwards until we can get going. Got to figure out all the lighting and stuff like that. And Dr. Frost, um, I have a website that's going to launch in the near near future. So you know, oh. I'm I'm learning. I'm growing. Anything I'm I can do to help promote what you're doing in well. in the church there and in Arkansas. I grew up listening to a band called Black Oak, Arkansas. Are you familiar oh, with? Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, not a, lot of, not a lot of people know. They did back in the 70s. They don't today. But nice. This is uh, Amy Jill Levine. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, The Misunderstood Jew. Um, now, she's a liberal, critical kind of scholar, New Testament scholar. Um, but I've, I've been listening to her for years, and you know, she says a lot of good things. But anyway, she's Jewish, so she grew up in a Jewish home. So here's the, look, listen to this paragraph. Belief in Jesus, as, this, is how, this is how she starts the book. Belief in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, separates church and synagogue, Christians and Jews. It is not the only distinction, but it is the basic one. For Christians, the claim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is obvious. It is proved by Jesus' resurrection, confirmed by the Bible, and experienced by the soul. For Jews, claims of Jesus' divine sonship and fulfillment of the messianic prophecies are false. Since we live in a world of cancer and AIDS, war, genocide, earthquakes, hurricanes, the messianic age cannot be here yet. 
Hmm. Since there is no messianic age, obviously, the Messiah has not come. And that I've read countless times in many Jewish books and Jewish ecumenical books, with Bruce Chilton dialogues, Jacob Neuster, uh, Jew Christian dialogues. Um, they, they all say, uh, even uh, uh, Tobias Singer is another one. They all say the same thing. If Jesus is your Messiah, um, you can have it because this world sucks. And do you think a good response is they, they've they misunderstood the Isaiah 53 passage, the um, your Messiah first has to come on a donkey, humble, meek, um, to atone for sin, right? To um, accomplish yes. and pay for the penalty of sin. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, what, that's what's interesting because I do a lot of apologetics. I've interacted with many Jews. And, you know, it does. Now, how do you uh, See, in your, what you're doing, Jesus said, my advent, I'm Messiah, and I have not come to bring peace. Mm. I've come to bring a sword. Yep. You're going to see wars, earthquakes, famines, tribulations, persecutions, hatred, false Christ, false messiahs, false churches, false church leaders, false teachings. Well, Jesus, isn't it easier for you to point out these things if you're with us? Well, I am with you. Be not deceived. Be alert. Stay on guard. Keep your wicks trimmed. Keep your lamps filled. Love one another. Fellowship with one another. Iron sharpening iron. Encouraging one another in the faith. Help each other put the armor on. Your, your, your foe, the devil, and principalities and powers roam around constantly trying to invade on the inside, constantly trying to destroy you from the outside. And I'm with you always. Mm. But he's come to bring this tribulation and this destruction, this turning fathers. He says this. There's a expectation, as you were saying correctly, he will rule in the midst of his enemies. For how long? Because it also says that he will destroy all of his enemies and place all of his enemies under his feet. Mm. So if he's ruling as Messiah at the right hand of the Father, sitting upon the throne of David, Acts chapter 2, he says this, Peter says it. That's the promised throne that David saw. And that's fulfilled. Daniel seven thirteen. all power and authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. The nations are now mine. They've been given to me as a possession. I own them. They're mine. Make disciples of the ones. And I will be with you always in the midst of tribulation, persecution, famine, daughters turning against their mothers, fathers turning against their sons, sons turning. Because the gospel sometimes will divide a family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even a Jewish family. Maybe a Jewish son will believe that Jesus is Messiah and the Jewish parents are adamantly opposed and kick him out of the house. But that's what I've come to do until the end of the age. See, that all now starts making sense. It's like, oh, and this generation, Jesus is telling them when he says this generation, I adamantly agree that this generation is the contemporary generation. I've looked at this generation from every angle, and there's a few different good viable angles to look at that kind of, but the consensus of scholars, liberal conservative, is that it's a, it, Jesus is speaking to his contemporary generation. Pretty hard to get around that one. Yeah. Um, but what does he say to them? And this generation is the terminal generation that will see the glory of God. This generation will see all these things. What's all these things? Famines, earthquakes, Jerusalem, destroy wars, rumors of wars. And this generation will pass away. And another one's going to come. You're not the terminal generation. Mm. Instead, get out of Jerusalem. You're not. Uh, Luke's, Luke's way of saying it is you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Mm. That's, that's, that's what he's saying. So when he says this generation will see all these things, I have to ask, well, what is all these things? Well, that's the beginnings of woes. That's the woes, tribulations and famines and earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, which is still continuing, by the way. And will pass away. 
Now, heaven and earth, he's answering their question there about end of the age. Heaven and earth will pass away. But concerning that day, what day? When heaven and earth pass away. The end of the age, the question you're asking. When is the end of the age? Heaven and earth will pass away. But of that day, no man knows the day or the hour. And I thought, my goodness, that just makes too much sense. He's actually answering their questions. They're asking, when is the end of the age? When is heaven and earth going to pass away and the fullness of your glory be expressed and manifested like it was on the Mount of Transfiguration when you can command 12 legions of angels and just blow everybody away? You could destroy the Romans right now, Jesus, if you wanted to. You could do. You have this power to do this. Come on, let's see it. Well, I'm with you always until the end of the age. Until then, you're going to see tribulation, famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. You're going to see all this stuff. You're going to see Jerusalem itself. And so here's some practical advice. Get out of the city. Hope that it doesn't take place on a Sabbath. These are days of great tribulation. Well, for how long? Well, no one knows that, and I'm not going to tell you that. Hmm. And that's it. <laughs> I thought, man, I've spent too much time on this. <laughs> his, his, answer, his answer is rather simple go and obey my commandments in all of your areas of your life whether you're in school or whether you're at work or whether you're at church or in culture or, or uh, uh, my kingdom is to influence everything you do and think and you're got, that's going to cause enemies some people are not going to like you because you follow my commandments and they don't like that and they're not your friend anymore. Some of them may even speak evil against you. But I'm with you. So when you see these things, famines, earthquakes, persecutions, hatreds, I'm with you. You know, what? because I know what rejection means. And I, I know what persecution looks like. I even know what suffering for Can death Can we include means. in that these things, including the destruction of the second temple? I don't. I don't think that Paul is thinking about some rebuilt temple. I think Paul in Romans 9 through 11, right. the next thing on his horizon is life from the dead, is resurrection of the yeah. dead. That to him, that is a that is a restoration, because who's going to be raised? Well, certainly the elect of those of the tribes of Israel, like Daniel and Moses and all those people of Dan and Gop, Naphtali and, and, and Reuben and all of the tribes, uh, Ishakar and Surely there was those that truly followed the Lord that belonged to those tribes that are now dead, but their spirits are in heaven. They're going to be raised. Well, that's a rest. That's a resurrection of Israel of which the whole world will be raised in the nations. And I want to join in on that promise of resurrection. I want mm -hmm. to be a part of their resurrection. How do mm -hmm. I get in well, through their Messiah? Mm -hmm. so yeah. So this Paul idea definitely is talking about newness of life. Yeah. And so, like right. I said, I've really enjoyed Ken Gentry's book on, you know, how we missed the second coming. And I like how you said, yeah, there maybe is a couple of different good ways of looking at the all of it discourse. I love, uh, I love Ken Gentry. He and I, I, he's, yeah. I can't say anything bad about him. Well, hey, we continue to study these sh these things and show ourselves approved, Doctor Frost. Uh, thanks for. Coming on to the Apologetic Dog again. We're going to have to do this uh, more often. I'm going to call you up. And like yeah, you were pointing out, my heart, um, I, I care deeply about the souls that have been trusted to me at 12.5. And, you know, I don't necessarily ask for these wars, um, but I've been called to guard the flock, guard the deposit that's been entrusted to us. And so when oh. I start hearing the implications of, you know, spiritual warfare, man, it just it gets me going so thank yeah. you for shedding a whole lot of light on this. Um, do you have any final you. thoughts that you would like to tell us all? No, I, I, we're not. I'm not. I, I love Gary. I'm not attacking. You know, Gary blocked me on Facebook and stuff. I, I've been doing this on Facebook for 18 years, for so long um, that I, I, re I, I don't have time for dodging answers and snipey little <laughs> I just, you know, cut to the, cut to the chase, you know, you know, I, you know, I get the whole linguistics thing and semantics and all that. Most, most, uh, I spend a lot of my time reading, you know, postmodern philosophers on lingua language and linguistics and stuff, because it's very like Wittgenstein. I find it very interesting. So, but anyway, it's, it's political speak where you, and, and so I, you know, I, you know, Gary publishes my book 
um, or American Vision does, the ebook of it, and he endorsed it. So it's sending mixed signals because full preterism is condemned in that book. And, and here is an endorsement, but yet he won't condemn full preterism. Mm. So you can see where that, that's like you would be condemning of, of uh, uh, pedo baptism and then you're endorsing a book on <laughs> pedo baptism. That would send me a kind of a mixed signal, wouldn't it? Wait a right. minute. And I do don't you, do you agree with pedo baptism or do you not agree with pedo baptism? I, I don't agree. Dr. Frost, yeah. I just did a debate uh, about a week or so ago with a Lutheran on right, baptismal right. regeneration. So that's funny that but you that's mentioned what that. It is. That's what it yeah. is for me. It's like, it's like, so then you would turn around and endorse a book by Pato Bat. You know, it's like, yeah, well, yeah. You just had a debate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that's a, conf and I get inundated uh, with I, uh, instant messages and, and, and uh, emails and phone calls. You heard my phone going off. That's like that all the time. Hey, what do you think about Gary Moore? Um, he, he endorsed your book. And I said, I know. I don't know. I, he <laughs> I'm blocked. He won't talk to me anymore. He's yeah. blocked off a lot of people. He won't. Um, and this, we're living in a day and age of politics where you just can spin mm. lawyer eyes, I call it. Lawyers speak. You can just spin words and language and spin it. And. Christians are let their yes be yes and their no be mm. no. Tell me what you believe. You're not going to offend me. Just tell me. Just come on. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you believe in eternal hell or do you not? You know. Yeah. So it, th that's where that is. I love Gary. I recommend Gary's books. I, you know, I I don't know what's how the fallout of all of this is going to be. I'm just saying you're running. That Gary's running with with some. Folks, that I've I've watched families and lives destroyed by this stuff, oh. and I'm not exaggerating. Um, I, I've I've seen it happen. Um, I just got a call from a large, huge church in in uh, Oakview, California, who had to remove two uh, two families, a husband and wife. They they were coming in and just causing all sorts of problems, and they wouldn't would, wouldn't listen to the elders. And one of them, finally, they had to remove them from the church because one of them finally turned around and said, well, elders and pastors are not for today and you guys aren't pastors. That was only for them back then. And I thought, and the guy was calling and I said, that's what you're dealing with. So, Gary, if you want to run with that kind of crowd, whether you like it or not, whether you endorse that or not, that's your crowd. Yeah. That's, that's, that's who's using you right now. And I'm hearing it. My friend... I've had jeers from full preterist buddies that are still full preterist. Hey, we got Gary tomorrow. We got Gary tomorrow now. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so you might hear as a pastor someone coming to you, yeah, but Gary tomorrow believes. Right. And what do you do then? Because he's a respected, deservedly so. He's a respected person. And it just it it's not helping. Um, right. It just confuses and muddies the waters of an already muddy lake. Yeah. I want to clean the water up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hey, I think you're doing an excellent job of that. And thank you for coming back on the Apologetic Dog. And like you, I just want to echo this. We love Gary DeMar. Uh, so much yes. great work. And we've tried to highlight some of the points, especially in my life personally, where he's been helpful with me kind of reanalyzing. Absolutely you know, certain points when it comes to eschatology. And so we definitely highlight that, but I think you did a good job of also highlighting the concerns that we have. And so we just want this video to be helpful to other people. We don't want to bad mouth. Um, and so hopefully he'll unblock you one of these days um, in the near future, All Dr. Right. Frost. But thank All you right. so much again thank for you. your time. And I just want to also thank everybody that, that is tuning in to the Apologetic Dog. Uh, please like and subscribe. Um, please look forward to more future content. Um, pretty soon I'll be coming out with my buddy Trey Fisher on um, Cultish, where we uh, examine the Church of Christ, and we believe that they're a cult, and we say that with love, um, and to warn people and saying, hey, we, this can be traced back all the way to the Restoration Movement with Alexander Campbell. And so we got a lot more coming out in the near future. 
Um, also, I serve as a pastor and elder at 12.5 Church. Uh, please look at our website if you're interested in some, some more teaching series and things like that. And if you're in the area of Northeast Arkansas and Jonesboro, Arkansas, um, please search us out. We'd love to see you. Um, we recently had an event just a few weeks ago. We had Dr. James White come and, and preach on justification by faith alone. And then one of these days, we're going to get uh, Dr. Frost to come visit to, um, Jonesboro, Arkansas as well. So, Dr. Yeah. Frost, I'll see you later, and thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. God bless.